Vzniku vesmíru, cez toto, čo prežívame až po koniec času. Vede všade okolo nás. Vítajte pri špeciálnej epizóde vedatorského podcastu, ktorý sme znovu nahrávali na Starmuse. Táto epizóda bude v niečom trošku kratšia, lebo sme vychytali úplne unikátneho hostia, kde som ani nedúfal, že by sa nám to mohlo podariť, ale snáď môžem prezrediť, že stretol som ho cestou zo záchodov a <laughs> pýtal by som sa, či by po svojej prednáške nemal chvíľku a on mal. Brian Green ukončoval Starmusovou prednáškou o konci času a o tom, kedy bude vo vesmíre posledná myšlienka, tak my sme sa z neho pár myšlenok pokúšali vytiahnuť. Na nešťastie úplne na konci ho už potom stiahli do odvozu, už musel pokračovať ďalej, ale aj tak unikátna príležitosť pre nás. Dúfam, ja mu skúsim napsať e-mail, že či by niekedy nemal čas ešte sa porozprávať dlhšie, lebo to bolo pre mňa extrémne zaujímavé a čiastočne zmenil môj pohľad na niečo. Nebudem prezerázať na čo, možno niekedy túto epizódu rozšírime do niečoho dlhšieho a skúsime dorozprávať nejaké tie aspekty, ktoré nám on naznačil, ale teda aspoň prezerajím, že sa týkajú toho, či matematika existuje, alebo či ju, či ju vytvárame ako ľudia. Čiže nebyť ľudstva, či by tu bola matematika, taká ako ju poznáme, aj bez nás, alebo či ju vytvárame my a v princípe si nejaké mimozemšťania vytvárajú svoju matematiku. V niečom sa prekrývajú, v niečom sa neprekrývajú. Takže aj o takýchto veciach sme sa rozprávali s Brennom Greenom, jedným z najznámejších popularizátorov fyziky, teoretický fyzik, už teda viac menej bývalý, lebo sa venuje na plnom popularizácii, napísal mnoho neuveriteľne zaujímavých knížiek ako Elegantný vesmír a podobne. Takže užite si túto špeciálnu epizódu vedatorského podcastu, ktorú sme nahrávali na Starmuse. S Jozefom sme sa rozprávali spolu s Brennom Greenom a... Ak neviete po anglicky, chvíľku počkajte, my epizódy vydávame aj na YouTube, YouTube to chvíľku trvá, ale potom ich otitulkuje a tie titulky by sa mali dať automaticky preklopiť do Slovenčiny. Takže, takže tak, ďakujeme za pozornosť. Hello guys, we are here with exceptional guest. Uh, can you please introduce yourself for our listeners? Uh, my name is Brian Green. I think they, it's great. Uh, Usually it would require more, but in your case, case, no, no, more. In your, in your case, case that's a factory. <laughs> so we had a great lecture about basically the end of time. Hmm. But you avoided the question of origin of time. Yeah. So what is your stand on the past hypothesis? What is the source of the low entropy at the beginning of the universe? I wish I knew. It's a great question. Just I guess you don't have... Well, I have written papers on it. I don't think any of them really work. You know, one of the ways of thinking about it is when we say the early universe has low entropy, it's kind of a weird way of saying it because we believe that all the gas was relatively uniformly spread out. The microwave background radiation is homogeneous. And when we teach our students thermodynamics, we say when the gas is uniformly spread out, that's high entropy. So you might say, what do you even mean by low entropy near the Big Bang? And the answer is, it's the gravitational degrees of freedom that are in a low entropy state. So why aren't they excited giving things like black holes and things like that, which we don't believe? So why there do. wasn't a black hole at the beginning? Why wasn't it a black hole or many black holes in the beginning, right? And so one explanation that I played around with is, what if the gravitational constant in some way shuts off? as you go further and further back in time. So there wasn't any gravity in the early universe. In that case, of course, it would be standard thermodynamics that we teach to our college students. The gas would just be uniformly spread out and there would be nothing else. And then if gravity slowly turned on, it could turn on in an ordinary state, which wouldn't include black holes. And over time, it could then cause matter to clump and in that way yield structure. The problem with all these explanations is you have to then explain why it was the gravity was turned <laughs> off and it turns and you can't use entropy as part of that because then you'd be chasing your own tail so it, it's very hard for these explanations to really work so yes yeah, it's still a mystery why uh, why the gravity was uh, turned on after exactly <laughs> that that is the question but either direction of time either okay. why does it turn off or why does it turn on and Often when you try to write down a model for that, you wind up assuming low entropy as part of your explanation, but that was what you were trying to figure out in the first place. You're kind of putting so in the you answer. You want to circumvent this, but you can't yeah, factor it. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And for example, with the dark energy, it can be the same. Like we take it to be constant. 
but by the beginning of the universe, it was way different. Yeah. And maybe it will be turned off in a couple of years. And your prediction about not well, only yours, but you mentioned it during the talk of... Well, the DAISY experiment that you probably heard something about relatively recently s at least suggests the possibility. It's only three sigma, so it may go away, but there's a possibility that the dark energy does vary mm -hmm. over time. Mm. And if that's the case, then... The whole idea of trying to explain why the dark energy has a particular value, that question changes. It's no longer trying to explain a number. It's explaining a dynamical process, which at this moment happens to have a weird number that nobody can explain. But so what? It would actually be the dark energy is just decaying over time. That would be a very interesting way for this story to resolve. But we don't know yet. If it doesn't decay, if it stays constant, like Einstein's cosmological constant, then yeah. The distant galaxies will race away faster and faster over time. At some point, the deep field will be dark because the galaxies will be moving away so fast that the light they emit won't be able to traverse the gap between us. If a cosmologist is born, cosmologist is born in 100 billion years, it will be an easy job because we will think that our galaxy is yeah. and it will be mostly dark galaxy yeah. because we are running out. But isn't field. it sad? It'll be very easy but they'll also get the wrong answer, right? Mm -hmm. They'll think that there's one galaxy or just a local group of galaxies that are gravitationally bound together. They'll look out in the deep space, not see anything, and think that they're explaining all that there is. But we know that that's wrong, and yet future cosmologists may be led to that very conclusion unless they can sort of trust ancient knowledge from billions of years mm. in the past when we said, no, 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 there are other galaxies. They believe may, us. Yeah, <laughs> that <laughs> believe us, right. But, but like, do we believe ancient mythologies? Probably mm. not. And they may view it in the same way. But one way of looking at it is, well, they wouldn't have Hubble-type discovery that yeah. there are different galaxies and we are evolving. Hubble, the matter, we should be fair to Yes, I agree <laughs> with you completely. <laughs> but I think Boltzmann and Clausius missed the opportunity of predicting Big Bang from the growth of entropy. So maybe yeah. we will find at least hints or plausible explanation. Although, will anybody believe them is the question. Mm. Because the data of the moment can be so overwhelmingly compelling that to suggest that there's a greater dynamics and a greater universe that may not look just like what you're seeing, it can be hard for people to swallow that. But yes, if they're sufficiently industrious and mathematical and smart, as I suspect they will be even smarter than we are, no doubt, then yes, they could understand a lot more than what the bare data would suggest. And aren't we in the same situation right now? Because for example, for us, multiverse is yeah. a good explanation of why the fine tuning of constant and so on but yeah. we cannot be completely sure right. and maybe this is the same with the string theory that it's basically a working theory of quantum gravity but there are so many loose ends which you can yeah but you, you don't want to push that reasoning too far i guess my view is you should allow for the possibility of a multiverse because as you know it can be useful to try and explain things which a single universe theory doesn't do a good job at, such as the value of the dark energy. But you shouldn't get lazy and then give up in trying to find a more traditional explanation that may not mm -hmm. need the mm -hmm. multiverse. That's really my only concern there. So yes, you should have in your toolkit these exotic possibilities of universes beyond ours, but you shouldn't stop there. Mm -hmm. You should press on with more conventional explanations. And when they're truly exhausted, which they're not, but if they were truly exhausted, then perhaps you say, you know what? There's just nothing left. Let's take these other more exotic explanations very serious. Mm -hmm. This is a good question. Can we reach the point when we say there is nothing left? Like in the no, sense of no, questions, yeah, 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 like nothing, nothing in you to. Well, I think there may. Well, I think there may come a point when there's nothing left in terms of fundamental laws mm -hmm. and fundamental ingredients. I can imagine a possibility when we have no unanswered questions in that realm, but that doesn't mean science is over because then you need mm -hmm. to use those laws to figure out mm -hmm. all sorts of macroscopic and interesting microscopic and where does consciousness come? There are all sorts of questions. But the one thing I would caution on, over the years, I've taken a somewhat different view of mathematics. I used to think that we discover math, we discover the laws. I've become really convinced that we invent the math and mm -hmm. we invent the laws 
And so... I probably don't agree, so try to most first people, with Most people try to don't. Talk about this podcast, yeah. the same thing, is math is yeah. evolving or yeah. is color? Most, most people don't agree with me. And I don't have an airtight argument. Mm. And I need to tell you that I myself have I'm gone back and forth I'm, I'm over time. Here the but, you know, when you look at what the human brain does, mm -hmm. what does it do? It tries to find patterns in the external world in the era of our forebears just so we could survive and beat out the competitor for the limited resources, right? If you understood patterns, you could predict what would happen next to some degree of accuracy, and that gave you an advantage. Our brains have taken that pattern-attuned sensibility and pushed it ever further, trying to find patterns in cosmology and the formation of stars and all sorts of natural phenomenon. And what we have done, in my view, is we've developed ever more refined languages for articulating the patterns that our brains have been sensitive to. And that, to me, is what mathematics is. Mm -hmm. It's simply a streamlined language that we invent to explain our own perception of patterns in the external world. And you see it over time, right? I mean, Newton had his equations. Maxwell had his equations. Einstein has his equations. You know, the to standard model. To understand the yeah, just to understand. So none of these can be viewed as fundamental equations. All of them are provisional human proposals for how the world works. And I think that's all that we will ever do. I think we'll only ever have human-made proposals that are the best that we can muster at a given moment in time to understand reality. And so at some point, I think we may find that we're not pressed to make further progress. Mm -hmm. Our articulation is so refined that there isn't a need or a drive to go yet further. But that doesn't mean we found the universe's map or the universe's laws. It means that we have refined human beings explication of the universe to such a fine degree of precision that we don't feel driven to go further. I can imagine that would one day happen. Can you um, tell us about your Starmos experience and what was your uh, favorite part? Of and, and when will you bring your festival to Bratislava? Yes. We are yes. waiting. Everybody's yes. waiting for it. Yes, we would love to bring World Science Festival to all sorts of cities and Bratislava would be a great place to do it. So absolutely. Yeah, volunteers here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And no, look, you know, having the general public get excited about the ideas that we spend so much time I'm thinking about and developing and discussing. That's really the most exciting thing of any of these festivals, whether it's World Size Vessel or Dharmas. And that's really what gets me excited about bringing people together to recognize how far we've gone in understanding the universe, which is totally astounding. So very quick, last final yeah. question. For Max Tegmar, the universe at the basic fundamental level is a mathematical universe. But you claim mathematics is invented by humans. So for you, what is the fundamental level of our universe? So I don't know. I, I'm I'm quite certain that Max is wrong. <laughs> I, I, I don't. <laughs> quite we've sure. discussed this. You know, I, I don't think that math is at the basis of reality. As I said, I think it's ideas that we develop. I think once all living systems have disappeared, I don't think math still exists. Mm -hmm. All that exists is the stuff that just goes about its business, right? And so if you ask me what's the fundamental architecture of reality, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know that there's stuff. I know that there apparently is law that governs the regularities and the behavior of the stuff. Is that the fundamental level of reality? I don't know. And we, when we find out, we'll meet again. And Absolutely. I'd be happy to talk about it. Thank, Thank you very much, Professor. Professor. Thank you. No a to už je z tohto rozhovoru všetko. Dúfam, že sa vám páčil. Ak ste doteraz počúvali a niečomu ste nerozumeli, lebo neviete po anglicky, tak prekliknite si na YouTube toto video. Mali by sa dať titulky preklopiť do Slovenčiny. Všetko sa tam môžete vypočuť. Ďakujeme, že nás počúvate. Nájdete nás na všetkých dobrých aj horších podcastových platformách. Máme ešte nejaké vedatorské ponožky. Máme novú knihu Rozhovory o vesmíre, ktoré som robil s Norby Wernerom. A čo ďalej dodať? Niekedy na jeseň plánujeme nejaké komunitné akcie a živé nahrávanie, tak sledujte Instagramový a Facebookový profil Vedatora, kde o tom budeme informovať, prípadne našu aplikáciu, kde si môžete púšťať podcasty, pridávame tam rôzne funkcie, napríklad sme pridali Dark Mode, um, pridali sme, alebo aspoň plánujeme pridať, rozmýšľam, kedy toto vyjde, uh, lepšiu navigáciu v podcastoch, takže tak, aby ste mohli mať podcasty a výstupy, ktoré robíme, dostupné zadarmo, bez reklám, bez sledovania, trekovania dát a tak ďalej je aplikácia Vedator. 
No a to už je na dnes z našej strany všetko. Majte sa pekne. Aj vy máte pocit, že história je divadlo, ktoré sa stále opakuje, len občas mení obsadenie a kulisy. Alebo skôr pozeráte na minulosť ako na mnohovrstevnú skladačku a záhadu, ktorá vás vťahuje a láka objavovať neznámy svet. Alebo sú dejiny len výmyslom tých, ktorí o nich hovoria, to je len zo pár otázok, o ktorých budete premýšľať pri počúvaní pravidelného podcastu Dejiny denníka SME. Odpoveď vždy nedostanete, ale už hľadanie a objavovanie je zážitok. Moje meno je Jaro Valent a každú nedelu sa spolu s hosťom vydávame na túto poznávaciu cestu.